Open your Bible, please, to Psalm 46. We're making our way one by one through the Psalms and uh, creating visual outline charts for them as we go. Psalm 46 is a very well-known psalm, and it's very, very fitting that we should be talking about this passage this morning, considering what happened here in Southern California on Thursday and Friday with those really big earthquakes. Thankfully, we were not uh, harmed by that, but this psalm mentions things like it. So before we get into our handout, let's uh, read the psalm together. We'll start with the heading and then into the poem itself. For the choir director, a psalm of the sons of Korah, set to Alamoth, a song. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, and though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake at its swelling pride. Salah. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling places of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She will not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations made an uproar. The kingdoms tottered. He raised his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Salah. Come, behold the works of the Lord, who has wrought desolations in the earth. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariots with fire. Cease striving and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Salah. Well, let's talk about the setting of this poem, and uh, like with so many of the psalms, we have a little bit to work with, but not a lot in terms of knowing uh, exactly when it was written and what event might have happened to lead to its being written. There is no specific situation named in the heading. We know who wrote it, but, um, but the circumstances mentioned in the poem suggest that the song was written after Jerusalem had been delivered from a great invasion. Uh, Verses uh, 6 and 7 imply that, that there had been an invasion attempt of foreign powers against Jerusalem and the Lord had come to their rescue. Uh, The kind of situation where it just seemed like an overwhelming flood of enemies. Uh, uh, Let me me back up. There's a few things we know. The Lord is dwelling in Jerusalem at the time because it says in verse 6, God is in the midst of her. So that cannot be during the Babylonian exile because God is not dwelling in Jerusalem during the Babylonian. It can't be after the Babylonian exile. Uh, So it has to be while Jerusalem is still a functioning capital with the Ark of the Covenant there. So there's a couple different times that there were great threats to Jerusalem. Uh, It could fit the time of Jehoshaphat. You can read in 2 Chronicles 20 that Judah was invaded by a coalition of Moabites, Ammonites, and Inuites in the mid-700s. And Jehoshaphat told the people, uh, uh, leave the battle to the Lord. Uh, the Lord will save us in the morning. And, and, he, and he did. It could be that. I'm more inclined to think that this fits the, the great battle, the great siege by Sennacherib in Hezekiah's day. So that's, that's at the year 701 B.C. is one of the great uh, deliverances that Israel experiences Uh, So Sennacherib is the king of the Assyrian Empire. They have swallowed up most of Judah and they encircle Jerusalem and it looks like that's going to be the end of the kingdom. But the Lord preserves, remember the great story, 186,000 Assyrian troops perish overnight. In the morning, as the psalm says, he will help us. So uh, I, I think it could be that. I won't say dogmatically that that's the event, but it's something like that event. The sons of Korah were active in ministry. They're the ones who wrote this poem. Uh, they're active in that period. But as with so many of the Psalms, the specific events are not named. And what that does is it encourages later generations to keep using the song. So, uh, and I already mentioned point B, uh, that 
This couldn't have been during the Babylonian exile because God is still dwelling in the holy city. Actually, the reason that Jerusalem falls in uh, the 600s and the late, early 500s is because God had abandoned them. God had left Jerusalem, and so their protector was departed from it. All right, so the setting is some great kind of invasion. Now, there's a reference early in the psalm to catastrophes of nature, but I think that's used more as a word picture for the great swelling of the armies that had come against them. Let's talk about what kind of psalm this is, the $50 word for kind of psalm. A kind of literature is genre. It's our French word for the day. Actually, every Sunday I use that word, don't I? Genre. So what kind of a psalm is this? About the a dozen different kinds of psalms that there are. This is a corporate psalm of trust. A psalm of trust. So I think probably the most famous psalm of trust is Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. There's, there's not a single prayer uh, in that psalm. It's just an expression of trust. Now the difference between, say, that one, the Lord is my shepherd, is that that's an individual speaking. David himself. Here, it's we. The Lord is our refuge. The Lord is our strength, our stronghold. Everything that the people are saying is in the plural. So this is what we call a corporate song. This is something for the whole congregation to sing together. The speaker in the psalm is always in the plural, we. So that's why it's corporate. Uh, the song celebrates God's protection of Jerusalem, particularly verses 4 and 5, which we read before. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling places of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She will not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. So the song celebrates God's protection of Jerusalem. And because of that, some have said that, no, this isn't a song of trust. This is a song of Zion. The song of Zion. There are some songs, some psalms, that are focused on what a great thing it is that God has done in Zion, how he keeps Zion and protects it, and his holy dwelling place is there. And there is this idea, certainly within, within the psalm, but it's interesting that the word Zion here is never used. And, and most of the psalm, though, is more about God's protection, how trustworthy he is. So I think there's some elements of uh, uh, the idea of Zion being a place to celebrate. But Jerusalem is mentioned in the middle of the poem, but there's also many other places of geography mentioned. At the beginning of the poem, you have the sea and the mountains and the land, Far, which is not near Jerusalem. And then at the end of the psalm, you have the nations of the whole earth are mentioned. So while Zion is in the middle of this poem, there are really things all around the world that are discussed as well. So it's a corporate psalm of trust, and this trust is in the God of Zion. Let's move uh, to the second panel of your handout on the inside. Talk about the structure. There's three parts to this poem. There's a declaration of trust, which opens up the poem. Um, you know, we will not fear because God is our refuge and strength. There's a celebration of triumph in the middle of the poem, verses 4 through 7, uh, how the Lord has come to Jerusalem's rescue. And then the end of the poem is an invitation to trust. There's two commands where the, the people are called to come and behold God's work. And then there's the command to stop what you're doing and, and know that, he is the mighty God. In a way, that's an invitation uh, for people to trust in him. So letter A, the first section in verses 1 to 3, opens with a clear confession of trust in God. And then it presents a, a list of worst possible suspects, or, or worst possible scenarios. Uh, worst possible scenarios are uh, from the world of nature. Uh, the earth shaking, the sea overcoming the land, the mountains dissolving. Um, the second section celebrates how God delivered Jerusalem from seemingly certain defeat. And then the final section, 8 to 11, calls on people to believe in God, to trust in him, and of course to believe that he is the conqueror, he is the victor, he is the one who will, in the end, win the final war and usher in an age of peace. And these three sections are clearly marked off by a couple features. You, you notice there are three times we have uh, that little notation, Salah. You see it there at the end of verse 3, at the end of verse 7, at the end of verse 11. 
Now, Salah, there's a couple things about Salah. One is we don't know what it means, and that's why we don't even translate it. Uh, it it's those letters you see, that's basically spelling out the Hebrew word in English letters. Um, the theory is that it's some kind of a musical notation, some note to the musicians that maybe they should, the singers that they should pause, maybe that the musicians should play an interlude, but, but we're kind of guessing. Um, uh, it, does not, it doesn't mean think about this. I, I've heard that said many times. It doesn't really mean that. Uh, maybe, maybe people would use that pause to think, but um, it, it's some sort of musical notation. In this case, that marks off the three main segments of the poem. And then the second and the third sections of the poem each have a repeated chorus. Notice that verse 7 and verse 11 are identical to each other. Uh, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. That's a, it's a refrain, a chorus. And that marks off the second and the third sections. Those two sections have more in common with each other. Those two sections deal with God's working among the nations and protecting his people, whereas the beginning of the poem is more introductory, uh, talking about the great powers of, uh, of nature. Let me make a few notes, uh, observations, before we... Uh, make our way soon into the, well, I don't know if it'll be soon, but before we get into the visual outline chart. Letter A, the imagery in verses 1 to 3 is likely a worst-case hypothetical situation. That is, I don't think that what, in, what it led the sons of Korah to write this poem was that there was an earthquake or that there was a tsunami. That, the catastrophe described in verses 1, 2, and 3, particularly verse 2, Though the earth should change, though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though mountains quake at its swelling pride. I don't, what that sounds like is a combination of an earthquake, tsunami, and landslide. And the result is it, it totally redraws the map. So uh, I don't think that happened on the coast of Israel. I think this is a hypothetical. Even if this were to happen, even if the unthinkable were to happen, Worst case scenario, we will not fear because God is our refuge. I think the real threat to the people was not those natural disasters, but the invading armies that are mentioned in the second part of the poem. Because those invading armies threatened to crash against Jerusalem in wave after wave of offensives. In fact, it's interesting that in verse 3 and in verse 6, we're told that in verse 3 that the nations roar, and in verse 6... We're told that the nations roar. Same Hebrew word is used for both sections. And I think that helps us understand that the imagery at the beginning of the poem is more imaginative uh, as opposed to, we just had a really big storm, let's write a song about what happened. So I think, uh, again, verses 1 to 3 is talking about a hypothetical situation. Uh, I'm going to flip the board over and we have some more room here. Letter B, there's a reference to a river in verse 4. The description of the river in Jerusalem is unusual because unlike a lot of other ancient capitals, Jerusalem does not have a river. There is no river. Uh, a lot of ancient capitals, a lot of ancient cities, in fact, would be built along rivers because you can navigate and Commerce can flow through there, and of course you have a water supply. Typically, cities get built where there is a water supply. Um, but Jerusalem is not situated along. There are some creeks and streams that flow intermittently, but no regular river. So what kind of river is he talking about? M move over to the third panel, uh, number one. One idea is that this is a prophecy of what will be Jerusalem in the age to come. And uh, in Ezekiel 47, the prophet Ezekiel foresees a time when there will be a majestic river servicing the city of Jerusalem in the millennium. And so if this is what the psalm is envisioning, then this verse then is a prophecy about the golden age, the final golden age. I used to think that's what this was. I now don't think so. I think that this psalm is talking about some preservation of, of the city in the songwriter's day. Even today, even though there's no uh, river, Jerusalem has at its foot something, a famous place called the Gihon 
spring. The Gihon Spring, which pumps hundreds of thousands of gallons of water a day uh, at the foot of Jerusalem. In fact, the name, I'm going to draw a really bad map. Well, no, you have a map. You have a good map. I'm going to, uh, you can look up here at the screen. I'll, I'll zoom in a little bit. So the, uh, this is the, uh, can you see, I'm going to draw here a little bit. This is the city walls of Jerusalem in the days of Hezekiah. Now, in the days of Jesus, Jerusalem would be three or four times bigger. But in the days of Hezekiah, it's this big. When David took over the city of, of Zion, it was just this. It was just that. And Zion was a fortification built right here on top of the Gihon Spring. Because the Gihon Spring was one of the lowest spots in Jerusalem. So if you want to protect your water supply, you better build a fortress over it. Zion means fortress. So David overtook Zion, and it became his fortress. And then he expanded the city out like that. Now, but this is in a low spot, this spring. It's a pretty impressive thing. You can read the story about how David conquered the city. Uh, there's, a, there's a spot, um, how, do you, how do I describe this? Down in the Goli, there's a little access point to that spring, but uh, they dug a shaft that went down 30 feet so they could draw buckets down there and get water up. And that's how David's men scaled up that thing and overtook the city that way. But it was still a vulnerable place. So the, the, in the days of Hezekiah, the Assyrian army is going to be encircling uh, the city all around, and they're going to try to cut off that water supply. So what Hezekiah's men do I'm going to scroll up now to, if my tablet will let me. What they did, you can see on, they dug shafts to bring the water here. See how here is the city gate or the city wall. They, um, they dug these water shafts so that it would pool inside the city wall. And they had workers digging. And what they're doing is they're, they're chiseling away following the natural fissures in the rock. Because uh, there was probably a tiny bit of water that was uh, getting from Gihon over there. So they had a crew from the south and a crew from the north banging away. And there's actually, there was a plaque engraved in Hezekiah's day, put there in the middle of the tunnel, celebrating how the fact that the, the two workers, their axe handles hit each other at one point after breaking through. And it, was, it was a great feat of architectural uh, work. And it's one of the things that God used to preserve the city of Jerusalem in 701. So you end up with an underground river <laughs> that is funneling, the, that is feeding the city of Jerusalem, and from this they would make other little tributaries to, to feed different pools. So, uh, again, letter A in your handout, before the great Assyrian invasion in 701 BC, Hezekiah's men dug tunnels under the city to connect the spring's water to secure pool, pools inside the city. You can read about it in 2 Chronicles 32, verse 30. By the way, the plaque was just discovered about 50 years ago. Uh, and uh, th the tunnel was lost, and I think there was some kid found it, found his way into it, and they dug it out. And now you can walk through Hezekiah's tunnel. I, I did it about 20 years ago. So the question, you know, with all that going on, you sure the inhabitants heard that. Is there any record of, of that? I mean, Oh, I'm sure every, everyone knew what was going on. And in fact, uh, it's interesting. Isaiah, um, on one hand, he uh, he credits how the Lord used this, but he also he also goes after the leadership for trusting in themselves. And while they were doing this, there was a tendency to think, "Well, we can do this ourselves," you know. But um, so yeah, people knew people knew it was going on. Uh, and there, there are spots where the men started digging up too high and they abandoned a part of the shaft and then they come back down and eventually. So when you walk through, you have to go when the Gihon is not pumped recently because it, it'll, it'll drown you. <laughs> you know, but if you go in between pumps, you know, the water will come up to about, uh, about here. And, uh. Interesting because the, I, I was thinking like of the New Jerusalem mm. and the river that flows. Yeah, through. which is Ezekiel. Yeah, just kind of like the Ezekiel 47 image. Yeah, yeah. Um, there, though, you don't have, there's not so, and the New Jerusalem has no threat of invasion. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Um, so I used to think that verse 4 and 5 was a prophecy, but I'm inclined now to think that he's talking about the Lord's supply of, uh, of the city. So, it, so in this way, then, point B in your handout, the city had an underground river. Underground rivers are real. <laughs> they count, <laughs> you know. Um, at supplying it, even, even if it's totally besieged, they're able to get water from that. All right, go to the back, pan, the back side, and we'll look at uh, the panel over on the left there in your handout. Another note, in verse 10, there's a very famous line, cease striving has the New American Standard. Uh, most, uh, more famous, I think, is the King James rendering, be still and know that I am God. But this, uh, even if you translate it as be still, what the psalmist is saying is not about calming your heart. Uh, and, and, I, and I realize that when I say this now, I am swimming upstream against a mighty torrent, a current, because everybody uses this phrase, be still and know that I'm God, to assure people, hey, just, just relax, trust in the Lord, be still, let God be God. And, and we have songs to that effect, and they edify people. It edifies people. That, that, there's a biblical notion that. I just don't think that's what this verse is about. The, the, the phrase... Uh, be still actually means stop. You know, and in the context, it seems to be talking to the nations, stop fighting. You can look at the previous verse. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth, breaks the bow, cuts the spear in two, burns the chariots with fire. And now for the only time in the verse, God himself speaks. Everything else in the poem is the word of the psalmist. But now God himself speaks and as he's making war cease, he says, stop <laughs> and know that I am God. And, and the word God, uh, Elohim, uh, the, the root idea of, behind that word, that, that it's not actually a name, it's a title. The root idea behind that is mighty one. Uh, and then he declares, I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. You, you cannot ramp up war against me and win. He's the ultimate champion. So the call is made, I think, to Israel. I should say is made, not us made. The call is made to Israel's enemies to stop waging war against the invincible God. Now, it's an invitation to all people, I think even to Israelites, to end their hostilities and to believe in the God of Jacob. God of Jacob. And, that, and this leads me now to talk about the, uh, another observation. It's an interesting title, The God of Jacob. Twice in the poem, this, the patriarch's old name, Jacob, is used. We've been studying about Jacob in our Genesis series together. Usually in the Bible, it, the new name is used. What's the new name of Jacob? Israel. Israel, right. But sometimes the old name is brought up. And almost always when the old name is brought up, it's to highlight that the nation is weak. That they are just like Jacob was weak, spiritually weak. And, you know, after the Lord touched his thigh, physically weak. Uh, so often in the Psalms when, uh, in fact, there's a spot even in Isaiah where the prophet is speaking comfort to the nation who's battered and bruised and been through deportations and exile and all that. And uh, he, he's, he speaks, comfort, speaks comfort to the do not, uh, do not fear, O oh worm, Jacob. <laughs> um, I know you're weak and I will care for you. So the old name is sometimes used to highlight the weakness of the nation and their need to rely on God because apart from him, they have no strength or hope of success. And that is true of us as well, isn't it? Let me make a few notes of application before we walk through the visual outline chart. Um, letter A, the reason that Zion was so unconquerable was because God was dwelling right in her midst. That's what it says in, uh, in verse 5, the Lord is in the midst of her. This was the place on the earth where the Lord had made his physical presence known. Uh, and as long as God was in her midst, she was invincible. But when Israel finally broke the covenant, what are we told in the Old Testament, we're told that God departed from the temple. Uh, Ezekiel, the prophet, sees a vision of it. 
Uh, it's a horrible sight of the glory of God leaving the temple and leaving Jerusalem, in essence, defenseless. And it will be shortly after that that Jerusalem falls to Babylon, ultimately in 586 B.C. Now, in our new covenant relationship with the Lord, we are promised that the Lord will never leave us. We, we relate to the Lord under a different sort of relationship through the gospel of the Lord Jesus. And to enter into this new relationship with the Lord means that you become a new person. You're in, entered into this eternally saving experience. We never have to worry about the Lord leaving us. That doesn't mean, though, that we are not prone to suffer losses and persecutions. On this side of glory, we are. Um, but our eternal home and our blessed future can never be taken away by any threats that we experience in the present. They may kill us, but that will not undo the promises of the gospel. We have a home in the kingdom to come, and nothing can shake us from that promised future. This psalm was the basis of Martin Luther's famous hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, a Bulwark Never Failing. Our helper, he amidst the flood, verses 1, 2, and 3, of mortal ills prevailing. So a lot of the imagery of that hymn comes from this song. Yes, Selena. In his leaving, he even showed mercy because it was a process. Yes. It wasn't a complete just walk out. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and the prophets beforehand had been warning them, you know, that the Lord would abandon them if they continued the way they were too. So yeah, multiple levels of, of warning. And yet he, he left them, and yet with the promise that he would come back. And uh, so far, the most glorious return of him has been in the first coming of Messiah, when the Shekinah came back. Veiled, but came back. And, uh, and coming again too. Isn't that great? Um, last note I'll make before we look at the, at the chart is that sometimes Luther's associate Melanchthon would have to bring bad news to Luther and uh, Luther would often say to him, come, come, let us sing together the 46th Psalm. Isn't that something? Well, open up to the last couple panels to your visual outline chart and, and I'll uh, switch here to the screen to that too. And up at the top, there is a purpose statement that says, after some notable deliverance, uh, after some notable deliverance of Jerusalem from overwhelming forces, this psalm celebrates God's protection of the holy hill of Zion and his people who trust in his care. They have no need to fear, for God's power is greater than all the worst calamities and conflicts imaginable. Uh, over... Uh, to the right, it tells you the type of song. It's a song of trust with elements of a song of Zion by the sons of Korah, maybe from around 701 B.C. Uh, after Sennacherib's attempted invasion. So over on the far uh, right side, left side rather, there are a number of headings. There's the authorization for the choir director. That is, the choir director is permitted now to arrange this and have it performed as he deems fit. It's by the sons of Korah. That's the author there's a musical note. It says, upon Alamoth, uh, or set to Alamoth. Alamoth means young women. Uh, so that either means this is a musical style, that, uh, or maybe it means it's supposed to be sung by high-pitched voices. Uh, something like that. And then it says that it's a song. Now, that might mean that this is supposed to be sung a cappella as opposed to with instrumentation. But we're, we're kind of guessing. It's some sort of a musical notation. The body of the poem, again, has three main parts, and it starts with a declaration of trust in verses 1, 2, and 3. Versus, uh, it's confidence in the midst of cosmic chaos. There's an initial confession of trust, and God. psalms of trust often start off with a, an opening statement about how trustworthy God is or how I trust or we trust in the Lord. And that's what you have in verse 1. God is our refuge and strength a very present help in trouble. And then right after that is resolve not to fear. Therefore, we will not fear. And then after that is a catalog of imaginable calamities. Let's, let's think, what's the worst possible things we could think of? 
the swelling seas threatening to overthrow the strongholds of the earth. I mean, you, you can't think of something in the, in the natural world stronger than a mountain. But imagine a tidal wave so great that the mountains just sort of crumble and dissolve and melt on some giant landslide and down they go. That's, almost, that's unthinkable. But even if the unthinkable happens, we will not fear. God is our refuge, and no wave can crash against him. Now, by the way, this doesn't mean that um, you can be foolhardy and not make any preparations for things like earthquakes. Uh, it doesn't mean, yeah, don't worry about getting water or an earthquake kit or anything like that because God's your refuge. Well, uh, yes, but the Lord will also use your advanced planning <laughs> to help care for you in those natural disasters. And ultimately, the thing that we're protected, the, the greatest things against this are, aren't even the physical things, they're the spiritual things. So there's a celebration of trust, and then verses 4 through 7, the middle portion, is a celebration of triumph. There's been a victory. There's confidence in the safety of God's city. It starts again with a confession of trust in God's presence in Zion. There's the peaceful river of God's city, which we talked about. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. How do they make them glad? Well, when you're surrounded by enemies who want to cut off your water supply, but you've got a water supply streaming in, pumping in every day, bringing you relief. And how different that river is from the swelling, foaming, threatening waves that are mentioned in the previous verse. The enemies are coming against them. The Bible often says the enemy came against us like a flood. Uh, but in the midst of that, here's this calming supply uh, of water in, in the city. Verse 5 mentions the presence of God as the city's greatest defense. God is in the midst of her. She will not be moved. God will help her when the morning dawns. Uh, yes, there'll be a, a night of adversity and worrying and wondering how is this going to work out. But remember the story of Sennacherib's invasion. In the morning, 186,000 troops lay dead, uh, stricken by the hand of God, one of the great greatest defeats of the Assyrian army. So there's a confession of trust. And then verse 6, there's a celebration of, this, of a recent victory. There was a threatening uproar of invaders at the beginning of verse 6. The nations made an uproar. Uh, and again, that is the same word, verse 6, uproar. That's the same word used to talk about the waters in verse 3. The waters roar and foam. They made an uproar. But then what happened? And, and the kingdoms tottered. So the, if this is talking about the Assyrian invasion, Assyria had been coming down from the north and they'd overtaken Syria. They'd overtaken Israel. They'd overtaken large parts of Judah. They'd overtaken Moab. They'd overtaken Philistia. They'd overtaken Phoenicia. They'd overtaken... They were gobbling up everybody. Kingdoms were falling. But Jerusalem stands when it's all done. Um, there's this threatening uproar of invaders. But then God speaks. He raised his voice. The earth melted. Every, now that's metaphorical here for uh, just everything changed. I mean, it, it looked like it was an impossible scenario, but the Lord spoke and everything changed. And then that, in, that section ends with this refrain, a celebration of God's protective power, the Lord of hosts, that is Yahweh of armies is with us. The God of Jacob, the God who helps poor, weak Jacob, is our defense, our stronghold. Well, the last part of the poem, over in uh, verses 8 through 11, is an invitation to trust. So it started off with a confession of trust, and now it ends with an invitation of trust. And it's a forceful invitation. It's not a pleading kind of invitation. Oh, please, come trust me. It's like, you better... You better trust me. <laughs> uh, so there's a summons in verse 8 and 9 to behold God's power. The introductory call in verse 8, Come, behold the works of the Lord who has wrought desolations in the earth. Now th that begins the description of God's power. He is successful in waging war. He makes desolations in the earth. I mean, look at the mighty army of Sennacherib. 186,000 dead overnight. Um, he's successful in waging war, and his, he, is, he, his, he also is successful in ending all war. Look at verse 8, verse 9. 
He makes wars to cease to the ends of the earth. So this is something that the Lord has done throughout history. Empires have risen and and threatened to rule the whole world, and the Lord, in his sovereignty, brings them down. Sometimes, like in the case of Sennacherib's invasion, miraculously will bring them down. Um, Makes wars to cease to the ends of the earth. Breaks the bow. The, The verb for breaks suggests it's done again and again and again and again. It's like going through the whole arsenal cuts the spear in two, burns the chariots with fire. Uh, So, and I think verse 9 is hinting at what will take place in the end of the age where finally all war is put to an end and there will be the reign of the kingdom of God alone. And notice how verse 10 now actually is a prophecy. Whether verse 9 is prophetic or not, verse 10 clearly is. In verse 10, there's a divine summons. That is, God himself speaks for the first and only time in the poem. It's a call to stop fighting. A call to stop fighting in the presence of the all-powerful victor. Cease striving and know that I am God. And then he makes the prophecy that there will be worldwide recognition of his supremacy. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. And I think this is the same thing that Isaiah the prophet heard the angels say. In chapter 6 of Isaiah, uh, he hears the angels, the seraphs surrounding the throne, and they cried out day and night saying, Holy, holy, holy is Yahweh of armies. The whole earth is full of his glory. In the Hebrew text, there is no word for is. It's, It's literally the whole earth full of his glory. And I think the flow of the book of Isaiah indicates that that is a prophecy about the future. The whole earth will be full of his glory. And that's how the book ends, with the glory of the Lord overtaking the world with the reign of of Messiah. And I think that's what this verse 10, the end of verse 10, is talking about as well. Every eye shall see him. And as Paul puts it, quoting Isaiah, every knee shall bow. And every tongue shall confess. And then Paul adds that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Well, the poem then ends in verse 11 with another celebration, a refrain, the celebration of God's protective power. The Lord of hosts is with us. God of Jacob is our stronghold. So this is a a poem written uh, by Israelites in the midst of their special covenant with the Lord. But you know, There is so much transferable truth to us. Uh, The God of Jacob is our God as well. Uh, And the mercies that God showed to Israel, he shows to us. And yes, we may have many things come up against us. They may be natural problems. They may be illness. It might be adversity of a hundred different kinds. It might be personal adversity. There might be uh, people who speak ill of you or in other parts of the world, we have brothers and sisters who are physically harmed. But even those worst possible scenarios do not undo the promises of God. The promise that Christ is with us and in us and for us. The promise that God is using all things to work together for our good. The promise that he has a glorious end for us. For Israel, there was a lot of enjoyment of glory here and now. The gospel causes us to look to the age to come and the future life. And nothing can shake us from that mighty grip of grace that God has for us. Well, we're going to close in prayer in a moment, but I'm going to leave a moment if there's any questions or comments before we conclude. I almost feel like we ought to sing A Mighty Fortress is Our God, but uh, you might not remember all the words. So, <laughs> All right, let's have a word of prayer. Our God and Father, our fortress, our deliverer, our strong tower, we thank you that Uh, Your name is a strong tower and the righteous can run into you and be safe. We thank you for the sure promises that you've made to us in the gospel. Uh, The promise that there is a future of glory for us. The the promise that in the present you are with us to encourage us and to supply us. uh, And that for us there are streams of living water within us because of the work that Jesus has done. So, Father, encourage us in all of our adversities and troubles to know that you are our strong tower and that we can be and feel safe and fear nothing as we are in you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.